Welcome to Day 3 of Week of AI by Teacher Goals. Hey teachers, and welcome to CurePod. I'm just going to show you some of the few things you can do to use CurePod magic to create some great lessons. So now I'm inside the creator. I'm starting off, I go here to generators, and I'm starting off, I want to create a brain break for fifth grade. I press do magic. Here's a brain break, it's a drawing activity, and I'll add it. I'll go back to my generators, and now I want to test out the explain it like I'm five. And I want to explain kinetic versus potential energy. And do magic. And it creates some. And here's an easy explanation of kinetic versus potential energy. I'll go back and I want a would you rather activity. My topic is animal habitats. And I'll do magic. Now it creates a would you rather question you can use for the topic animal habitats. These are some ways we have so many generators here. You can have fun, generate really interactive, engaging lessons. We also have an AI accelerator program open for applications to schools and districts, which will be an amazing opportunity for everyone to learn more about AI. Thank you everyone for trying out AI and have a great session. The next session will begin in 20 seconds. I love it. Hey, awesome. Erica. Yes, love. You're the best. <laughs> you're, the, you're the best co-host. You know <laughs> so, I, I'm. You know I love my puns. <laughs> so a little bit about a little bit about Dan. Um, Dan, which obviously he's here. We uh, I forgot to put you under, man. So um, my man Dan here is a big Star Wars fan. So I thought I'd pop out with some with with my Yoda filter. Um, his dog is actually named Wicket. So trivia, nice. guys, Wicket <laughs> is hilarious because I have a little mini schnauzer and I was, uh, I was in the same mindset. I wanted to name her Wicket. So uh, <laughs> a little bit of Star Wars trivia. Who is Wicket in Star Wars? Ooh, look yeah. at you. I go, I love this filter. <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, I'm going to go to... Hard work. This is the way. Thanks, John. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> this is the way. Oh, wait. Yeah. wait. Oh, that's oh. wonderful. Do I got a baby? Oh, you can't see it, but I have a baby Yoda on my back. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. You're so we'll fun. just this one. I'll have the little, little baby Yodas on my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I don't even think I don't even think Dan has Star Wars in there, but like, you oh know, <laughs> I had to. I just had to because I know you're such a big fan. I'm a huge fan. I love Mandalorian. I'm like so up to date on every every Star Wars that has been made. So, um not as big of a Harry Potter nerd, but when it comes to Star Wars, mm. I think we have um, a fellow nerd right here. Uh, Elena just says, not ashamed to say it, but I attended a few Star Wars conventions. That's oh, cool. that's oh, that's awesome. I didn't, know that. I didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to quickly I'm give you our, give you our, um, your background. So Daniel Jones is a middle school social studies teacher and reading and language arts teacher. He's a master flip educator and has been teaching in the classroom for the past 18 years. He is an FLGI international faculty member, master flip educator, and author of Flipped 3.0, Project-Based Learning, an insanely simple guide. 
He earned his master's degree from the American College of Education in the area of curriculum and instruction with a specialization in digital teaching and learning. You can connect with him on social media at Ideas for Teachers. And I'm going to put that in the chat because this is definitely someone you want to follow. Absolutely. <laughs> Do it now. Yeah. His work is amazing. I mean, look at his green wall. He has a green wall. You know I love him. <laughs> it's, it's functional. Cool. Yep, functional design. All right, um, Erica, you want to add anything or have a question for Dan before we pop under? Or? Oh no, no, I'm I'm just so excited to to see this man present. So yeah, I'm just gonna sit here and, and enjoy. You go nuts. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna pop under and uh, let you start your presentation on Flip PBL AI upgrade. I already awesome. love the aesthetics and the feel, and you made this ingeniously, correct? I did. Yep. Yep. So yes. another platform, if you haven't checked out Genially, it's That's like the schedule in it's schedule. Awesome. In I'm, a, I'm an ambassador as well. I, I think uh, Dan is too. Yep. Okay. This is going to be exciting because we're going to talk a lot about Genially. Um, we're, we'll talk about um, a lot of different programs. So I don't know that 45 minutes is going to be enough, but we're going to try to cram about eight hours into 45 minutes. Well, you're the last one tonight. So we have all night. We have we have all as, as long as they'll watch. <laughs> so um, just kidding. Guys. We will cut off at eight o'clock. So um, we're going to pop under and, and, and turn it over to you. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, I am a flipped educator. Uh, I've been flipping for about eight, well, 10 years. And so one of the first things I would like to do is just share my story. Um because I have not always been an extremely passionate uh, flipped educator. About 10 years ago, I was ready to exit the classroom. I was done teaching, and I had hit probably the lowest point of my educational career, and I was looking for something outside of education, period. Because every tool that I had acquired in my educational toolbox, no longer worked with students. And so I went to my administrators and let them know that it was going to be my last year in the classroom. And um, they, they let me talk for a bit. And then my superintendent looked at me and said, I'm not going to let you quit. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, what do you mean you're not going to let me quit? She said, well, you're a teacher. You're meant to teach. And you just, need, you just need to find a different way to teach. So I, I said, well, how else do you teach? You tell kids what they need to know. They memorize the information. They spit it back to you on a test or some sort of assessment. And then you press repeat and we do it all over again. I said, that's not working. And I'll never forget, both my principal and my superintendent were sitting there. And they, they looked at me and they said, we don't know how you're going to do it differently. We just know that you will find a way. So I typed in new and innovative teaching methods. And sure enough, one of the first things that came up was flipped learning. And so the more I read about it, I was like, okay, this is the way teaching was supposed to be done. And it's the way we haven't been doing it. And I don't understand why we've been doing it the same way for the past 150 years when this is the way it was supposed to be done. Because what it did was it reignited, one, it reignited my passion for teaching and it kept me in the classroom. And all of a sudden I saw purpose um, for doing what I was doing. And over the course of that time, we needed a new definition because Flip learning over the course of 10, 15 years has grown and changed as it should because it's not static. It is a constantly evolving um, power source for your classroom. So a few years ago, it's, uh, a new definition was created so that we all could be working from the same definition of what flip learning is. So it was called Flip 3.0. And what it is, is it is a framework that enables educators to reach every single student. And just that thought in and of itself is a powerful statement. To be able to reach every single kid sitting in your classroom is something that I, 
I had only dreamed about and only wished that I could do. But now, because of the structure of a flipped classroom, I have the time to actually do that. So by introducing those course concepts either before class or in an independent uh, setting, students then um, could come to class prepared to actually use that information. So it allowed educators to use class time to guide students, which was what I wasn't able to do previously in a traditional setting. I wasn't able to actually work as much with kids. We were sending a lot of the hard stuff home and that's when they actually needed their teacher the most was when they were going through the content and applying what they learned. That's when they needed me, their teacher, not standing up front just giving notes or um, telling them a fun anecdotal story about the content. That's all great and they need that, but that's not the best use of my classroom time. My best use of classroom time would be me actually working with the kids because that's what I got into education to do was work with kids, not lecture. And so the process of flipping a class, there's really two spaces. There's the independent space and then there's the group space. So I wanna walk you through what the independent space looks like. Um, it's where students are actually able to work through content independently. So whether that is um, something that's done in class and students are able to work independently in the room, or it can be stuff that is done at home and they can work independently at home. Great thing about this, and one of the things that really resonated with me was the fact that I always took notes slower than other kids when I was in school. And to kind of date my educational experience, I was the kid who raised their hand and ask for the transparency to be taken off of the overhead so that I could write down what the teacher had already written down five minutes before. And then the class was always kind of waiting on me. So there was that self-consciousness of, oh my goodness, everyone's waiting on me. Why am I doing things so much more slowly than everyone else? And this allows, this setup allows students to work at their own pace. So if students take notes faster than other students, Awesome. That's perfectly fine. But if you take notes more slowly, that's perfectly fine too, because it allows you that time independently to work at your own pace. Now, a lot of times I do have to explain to students that at your own pace does not mean no pace. There's still an expectation that you're making progress and moving forward. So it is definitely more adaptive to individual needs. Uh, so students are also able to process that information. And Julie said, that's absolutely right. They do take more ownership of their learning. Um, so when they're, when they're working through this, they are able to learn stuff um, before class, come to class, and actually apply what they're learning. So um, how do we generate this? A lot of times previously it was, well, flip learning is all about videos. You have to make a video. And if you're not making a video, you're not flipping correctly. Well, that's not really true. There, the content that you present can be done in a variety of manners. There are videos. You can use YouTube. You can uh, use Screencastify and uh, record your presentations that way. Uh, ScreenPow, which uh, used to be Screencast-O-Matic, uh, ScreenPow allows you to do the same thing where you're recording your screen. You could use Google Slides, PowerPoints, uh, Prezi presentations. You can make presentations on Genially. And um, you could have Google Docs, generate Word Docs. Um, you could have kids reading news articles and bringing that information to class. Now, where all of this gets really interesting is now we have AI components, which even if you think about six months ago, these things really weren't present in the classroom at least not to the degree that they are right now. So we have things like ChatGPT. So ChatGPT, one of the ways it can help you generate content is you could say, hey, I am um, writing, a, I need a script that is a minute and a half long and I need it to be about this particular topic or based on this particular reading. And ChatGPT will generate that boom, 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 done. And it will write out your script so that you could actually use it 
some sort of teleprompter to be able to work through content creation. You can use DID and actually create avatars, which you know the students are going to love because you can upload Pixar characters that you've created in other AR or AI uh, programs. Uh, Murph AI is really cool because you can actually upload audio uh, or scripts and it'll actually choose the audio for you um, so that you can have a different voice for your content. And I believe it'll even allow you to upload your own voice to the point where after you have uploaded, I want to say it's uh, 30 minutes worth of content of you talking, then it can generate your voice into that script and it's you reading content to your students. Now, I will say uh, with a lot of this, the more you can put you into your presentation of the content to the students, the better because you are their teacher. The students will resonate with you. So if you can put yourself into your presentations, it's amazing. Um, and the kids will get more out of it if you are a part of the actual lesson. Um, hey, Jen is also a really cool tool. It's like DID, um, but it also can be done. Um, it, it's just, it's a different AI device. Um, very, very similar though to DID. And Tomi is uh, something really that I jumped on today that it allows you to create presentations in a matter of seconds. So this is something that I want to be able to actually show you uh, because it works so fast that there's no reason why we can't do it live. So let's go ahead and we're going to jump into Tomi. Maybe. There we go. Awesome. All right. So from here, we can go ahead and hit create. And I'm going to create a presentation about the Boston massacre, because since I teach um, American history, this is all right. And it's generating our different slides throwing in some pictures to go with that information. And I will say the pictures are not awesome, but they at least give you some, some place to start. And as you can see, the entire eight slide presentation is done. And if we go back to slide one, this is a slide all about, you know, what they can expect throughout the lesson from here. These images, I would definitely replace them, um, and you can easily create something in mid-journey, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But this is just a fantastic tool that if you're in a pinch and you really need to get something done and done right now, um, it's a great tool. But it's also a fantastic tool um, where if you're just kind of drawing a blank and you're like, I really don't even know where to start in uh, generating this, you can use this tool and get your slide deck built very, very quickly. All right, so the process for the group space. This is where the fun of everything really is because this is a uh, space where students are able to apply what they're learning and they're able to really figure out what do I know, what do I um, have questions about, what am I confused with? And so the teacher actually gets to work with students as they're applying information. Um, like I said, it's real time clarification of misconceptions. One of the biggest changes though for me was a lot of times uh, previously homework, you know, you, you would assign certain things and then all of a sudden, you know, they would bring their homework in, you'd grade it um, and see, you know, how well do they understand this information? And a lot of times those grades go into the grade book. Well, I, I'm going to say that's wrong. Practice should not be graded. And 
the activities that are a part of the group space are non-graded. This is where kids get to have that freedom to explore what they know and what they don't know with the freedom of being wrong. Being wrong is okay because that's a learning opportunity for them to move forward. So the this space, it is both active physically as well as mentally. It's not, not everything has to be movement, but it does need to really cause them to think and process information so that they are active in mind. So taking you through some of these different activities that you see here, um, the student here that has all of these post-it notes on his face, it's a game I call post-it. And they, I give each group a set of post-it notes and I ask them to go through that, uh, go through their notes. They put one note on each post-it and the first team to cover one of their classmates' face in post-it notes, um, they, they win that portion. But then we get to go through and we take each group and we're going to put post-it notes up on the board and we're going to evaluate the information that they put down. Is it accurate? Is it um, duplicated? So they have to, one, have the most unique information that is accurate. And it teaches students how to evaluate the content um, that is being shared. The other activity where you see looks like it's in a gym. We are playing life-size hungry, hungry hippos. We have pieces of information because it's social studies. Um, there are different events and there's a different event taped to each of the balloons and the kids are on scooters. You have somebody that's holding their legs and driving them into the balloons. They've got to gather all these balloons together, bring them back to their team. And then they have to put that information in sequential order. So it teaches them timelines um, and it really helps them to focus on order of events. So the other game I have is called Walk the Plank. And it's a game where kids are given, again, pieces of information out of order and they have to reorganize themselves without falling off of the, the board. And it teaches them, you know, sequence of events. One of the favorite games of the class is the unfair game. And it's very much a um, competition of who can get the right answer uh, between two teams. And then they have the option of keeping the card um, or giving the card to the other team. So they may be keeping negative points or giving negative points to the other team. It's completely unfair as to who wins because you have teams who get the question right and then they'll give that card to the other team and the other team got five points. And the one of the wonderful things about that particular game and really any of the games that we do, there are no prizes. Nobody's getting bonus points. Nobody's getting, um, you know, stickers or anything like that. It's all just for the pure enjoyment of doing an activity. So one of the things I do want to share with you, because sometimes coming up with that many different games is a challenge. So I have created a um, Google Sheet that has all of this information on it. And it's something I would love for you all to be able to participate in and add the awesome things that you do in your classroom. So I'll jump over here to the sixth through eighth grade tab. And um, I've got the name of the activity in purple and whether it's content specific or not, what the grouping is, the purpose of the activity, what would you need if you were to do it in your own classroom? Um, things that you need to be mindful of. A lot of times when you're told, hey, try this really cool game, they don't always tell you, but you need to be aware that this, this, and this could happen, or you need to set it up in this particular order. Um, and so things to be mindful of. Then there's how to play it, as well as this particular um, portion. If I have a video for it or a picture that shows, hey, this is what you can expect. Um, I've linked all of those things over here. So I have about 16 that are already loaded in, but I would love for you all to be able to add to it because the more we can add um, to this particular document that um, we'll all benefit from it because 
we all have awesome things that we do in our classroom and it's nice if we can share. So as we move along, the way in which students gather this information is um, really important. I used to use Canva and there was, there's nothing wrong with Canva um, other than it's boring. It's super boring in its layout. And um, everything that I'm about to show you in our current format, which is all set up through Genially, everything that you see in Genially is present in Canva. It's just very linear. And um, it, it's, it just looks like long lists. But when you look at Genially, Genially, this is a very different layout. And it's something that I generated truly from scratch. And um, because there wasn't necessarily a template that I was like, oh, that's it. That's the one um, that's really going to grab the kid's attention uh, as far as an LMS goes. So what I did was I combined Genially with some AI components. So uh, the image that you see here, this is created. And actually, all of these images down through here um, as the different episodes, those are all created through Midjourney. And the layout, as I said, is through uh, Genially. And the format of a lot of the pictures, I did that on Canva as well as postermywall.com. So let's jump into this. I want to show you guys exactly what the students see as they go through um, accessing content. So that's their welcome screen. Um, I wanted it again to have very much of like a streaming feel to it. So the students will select their class and each of these posters would be a unit of study. So students are actually able to see everything that is going to be covered throughout the course of the year. And then we're gonna jump into the Bill of Rights. So they just click on the play button it takes them to this particular uh, home screen. And there is actually a lot packed in to this particular home screen. So some things that you'll see there, if the students click on just the Bill of Rights, they're going to get a, a pop-up window that's going to show the essential question for the whole unit, as well as every single driving question for the individual lessons. The awesome thing about that is you could use that to have students doing research prior to even beginning the unit. You have them look up all of those different questions and um, they're going to walk into the unit of study with knowledge. They're going to know something. And it's not like, ooh, I've never heard of this stuff before. They're going to do research. They're going to gather some information and they're going to be well equipped to be successful. So when we go back here, this is what that looks like. So to click on the Bill of Rights, and this window is going to pop up with all of the different questions that are going to be covered throughout the entire course of this unit. Now, if we were to click on episode one, that's going to take the student to this page. And everything that they're going to go through for this particular lesson is right here. So there is a video. So if they clicked on play video, it's actually going to take them to uh, a Kahoot lesson that I have made for them. And the awesome thing with Kahoot lessons is that it allows students to still have the feel of uh, playing a Kahoot because you can embed questions throughout the course of it. Um, but you're also able to put in your slides as well. So awesome uh, integration of the two. Then, well, you know, what? I'm going to pop over to this so you can see the layout. So they will have the Kahoot they will have options of a slide deck. So if the students click on this image icon here, it takes them directly to the slides. The download arrow takes them to a required reading piece. The um, bonus features is going to take them to guided notes. So if that's something, especially if a student's on an IEP or something along those lines, they're able to access guided notes. Then um, their quiz, because they actually have two quizzes. 
Uh, I'm a huge fan of mastery. And so students will have the option to take the first quiz. And um, if they don't score what I would say is an equivalent of a three or a level of mastery, then they're, they have to take the second quiz because they have to master the content. It's not an option. And they will continue to go through quizzes until they master it. And one of the awesome things is chat GPT allows me to take the required reading and I can say, all right, chat GPT, I need you to generate a 10 question multiple choice quiz and tell it multiple choice needs to be um, A through D options. And I want an answer key to go with it based on this reading passage. And then I'll dump in the reading passage, hit generate and boom, done. Um, takes it all of two minutes to do. And then it's a matter of inputting that information into a, um, a Google form so that it can be logged, tracked, um, and I can take that information and move it um, to our grade book. So what does this all actually kind of look like? So if we go through the slides, it'll just pop up a slide deck. If here's the required reading and one of the things you can do is you can actually embed for you, the teacher, to read the information to the students. Because the thing that you have to be mindful of, especially in a flipped classroom, is that not everybody's reading on grade level. And a reading assignment like this is going to be challenging. So you need to be mindful of that and actually take that into consideration. Read the content to your students so that all they have to do is hit here, you know, Mr. Jones reading this passage with you, and it'll guide you or guide the student through that content. So it allows for different layers to be built in because some students may not necessarily need to have me read it to them. So they don't even have to click that. Um, let's jump back here. Bonus features, like I said, those are their guided notes. So that'll pop up. Then um, this, the setup of this one, it, it already has the driving question for the lesson. Um, so we have unit eight, episode one, why was the constitution so difficult to ratify? Well, then we give a cast of characters. Who all are the students gonna meet throughout the course of this unit? They have all of those characters listed here. Where does this lesson take place? They have all, of, all the different locations. And again, these buttons here, take students to their quizzes. Now, every episode within a lesson has extras. The extras are what the students are gonna do for their activity. So students are gonna be presented with a video that they can watch in class. It may be Race to the Chairs, which is another activity that we do. Um, super fun, uh, gets very chaotic, but I firmly believe that a classroom that's not in chaos, um, organized chaos, let me restate that, organized chaos um, or intentional chaos. Um, the, the students, you know, they need to be up and moving. They, they need that energy. So, um, but I'll present information here. Usually there's some questions and then students, uh, I have Google Classroom linked. So all they do is click on the icon and it takes them to their Google Classroom where they can type and respond to peers um, if that is the particular lesson that we're looking at. All right, so project-based learning. This is the um, passion of my classroom because one of the things that really struck me was project-based learning is kind of ill-defined. Uh, it means different things to different people. And so when I was writing my book, I was like, you know what? I need a very simplified definition as to what project-based learning is. So it is the act of using a project as a learning tool for students to gain understanding as well as express mastery of the curriculum, because that is what they need to be able to do with their project. It's not about everybody doing the same thing. 
It's not about how easily can you replicate my project that I have put together that I think is really cool. It is all about the students and what they want to do for their project. So um, these are three different examples of things that students have made. These are cooler than anything I could have ever come up with or assigned. And there's also more to it than what I probably could have assigned. So um, we have a lighthouse that is all about the three branches of government. And she made a lighthouse. And there's so much symbolism built into each project that it just is mind-blowing. But it takes student learning to a whole different depth. So she built a lighthouse to show that America is uh, a beacon um, or a light of freedom and the color, the light in the top of the um, lighthouse is some, it changes different color to represent the diversity within our country. And she built all of these things. And this is eighth grade. These are eighth graders that are coming up with a lot of this stuff. So why is PBL so important? We're all, I would assume we're all very familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. And one of the things that really struck me was that Bloom's is really set up in time. It shows the amount of time dedicated in the classroom to each of those particular um, areas. So the bulk of our time in a classroom, in a traditional classroom, is spent on remembering and understanding because we spend so much time with that presentation of content. And so we really struggle to get to that apply because that often happens at home um, in a traditional setting, but there's not enough time to analyze or evaluate or create. So what I did was I took that um, taxonomy and I said, you know what, how can we make a PBL version of this? So because they're using the independent space for knowledge and understanding, that gives us so much more time to analyze and create in the classroom. The bulk of our time in the classroom is spent on the creation and analyzing that information. Does it work? Does it not work? Did I understand this correctly? And then they get to go and apply that and then evaluate how that information is going to fit in with the rest of their project because they're applying information as they're learning it. And that is a huge difference because the project goes on as the students learn and it's not just something that happens tacked on at the end. So this process of they gain new knowledge um, through a short video. And typically, if you can keep your videos to, say, three minutes or five minutes at, at the very longest, probably seven minutes, um, depending on age level. So the older the student is, the longer the video can be, but try to keep it under seven minutes. Um, or whatever content they're going through, whatever those are slides, whatever it may be. Um, try to keep it short because students, one, are more likely to complete it um, than if it's some extremely long 40, 50 minute lesson. Then the classroom activity is what's going to help kids uh, develop an understanding and provide it provides time to really analyze that information. And then we get to the creation part of project based learning. So this is a first step in that application of understanding. They're like, I get it. Let me do something with it. So then they apply that information and it leads to the evaluation of, oh, this is how this is connected to this. And I remember we learned about that previously. Now I see how all this lines up. So it's a wonderful process. It's actually a very magical process when you see it actually happen. So like I said earlier, the, the students are the ones who are creating the project. So whose project is this? The students are the ones that are designing this project. Because when they do that, it develops greater buy-in. The students have more ownership in the learning because it's theirs. It's their project. It's not mine. They're not working on my work. They're working on their work. And it's an application and mastery of the content. And what happens is the students say, I developed this. If I don't like my project, that's not my teacher's fault. I designed it. As a student, I designed my own project. So... When the students have control over how they express their knowledge, they are more willing to seek ways that will 
help them or will allow them to be as successful as possible because it puts them in the driver's seat. Because since they're the ones who are in control of their project, they know that they want to be successful. Students don't want to not be successful in the classroom. Even though you may have very apathetic kids in the classroom, they really truly do want to be successful. It's just now we need to give them the opportunity to be in charge to do that. So these are some quotes that I have from students. Um, Seth Will, he was a seventh grader of mine. Uh, he said, you know, I was allowed to create my projects relative to the content. The freedom excited me because I could show the content through my projects and not have to do what everybody else was doing. Because let's be honest, not everybody wants to be, wants to do a diorama. Um, so he was like, I was able to go deeper into subjects, allowing me to learn more than I was expected. And I never did the same project twice. So we have kids that are able to do game boards. We have kids that want to do comic books. We have kids that uh, want to build Minecraft worlds, that want to develop things in VR. Uh, they want to 3D print stuff. So we need to let them because if they're in charge, they're more willing to do the work. So I have Addison and we're going to see Addison's work a little bit later on. And her projects allowed her to be creative because she could take an understanding of the content. And if she's, she says she's not very good at taking tests. So it allowed her to do things her way and she could still show what she knows in ways that made sense to her. So again, it's always important that they're not doing crafts. Everything that they make is tied to content standards. All right, so AI upgrades, chat GPT, uh, mid journey. I wanna very quickly walk us through how do we make this happen? Um, so it, project development can be really hard for some kids. And because I allow them to use their passions and interests in developing them, sometimes they're like, okay, how do I use um, you know, what I'm interested in to be about westward expansion? Well, this particular prompt, it's really important in chat GPT that you assign roles to chat GPT. You tell it what it is. So you tell it you're a middle school student and that you're designing a project about westward expansion. You're allowed to incorporate your passions and interests. Your interests and passions are, and then tell it what its interests and passions are. So it knows what kind of things to work with. And then you can tell, look, your project is allowed to have symbolism in it. And that will build greater meaning into your project. And then tell it what supplies you have. These are the supplies that you have to work with. And so listed the supplies. Chat GPT comes back and says, all right, why don't you create a game board that takes players on a journey through Westward Expansion? And it can be made using these particular items. Uh, you can incorporate these particular symbols. And then you're like, okay, I get it. I like the project. What else can you tell me? So what can you tell me about, and you can even ask it for like four, five, six, however many project ideas. What can you tell me about number one? Well, and then it goes through a detailed response as to what all is included um, in that particular game. All right. So can you give me a supply list for the project? And then it does. It tells you, okay, this is what you'll need. This is what those items will be used for. Awesome. But if there's one thing that kids really, really struggle with, it's time management. How am I going to get this project done on time? Well, we need to tell chat GPT, look, I've got two weeks to get this thing done. So how am I going to get it done? Generate a calendar for me. And it does. It'll tell you week one, this is what you need to do. Here's what you can do on the weekend. Week two, go through these things. And here's the following weekend. So it will lay out a calendar for your students. Now, Mid Journey. Mid Journey is awesome. I love the images that it creates um, and it gives students a ton of freedom. Now, I will say it's most likely blocked in classrooms because it runs through Discord. And, um, but students love to use it because it's run through Discord. And so it, one of the things that I've done here is um, I've laid out kind of some things that you can use in your descriptions of um, images in Mid Journey. And so I'm not going to go through all of those, but those particular prompts, when you put that into a prompt, I asked it for a British Revolutionary War soldier wearing their red uniform, standing in a line at night. I would like cinematic lighting because I think that's cool. Um, I want a close-up shot. 
I'd love it for it to be very much like it's in a movie, so a movie angle, and why don't you throw in a portrait blur? So when I gave it that prompt, this is the image that it created. I was like, all right, that works. And so then I took this image and I put it into postermywall.com. And they have a ton of different layouts that you can use. And it turned it into this. So Boston Massacre, Lesson 7. And that is the image that I used for Episode 7, Unit 4, about the Boston Massacre. Now, you can also use Midjourney to mash some images together. So we had I took a picture of myself as well as Indiana Jones. I love Indiana Jones, love the story. And I said, all right, combine or blend these two images. And it turned out something like this. So at times it can be creepy, but it can also be kind of cool. Now, this particular um, slide here, this is my student's work. She was able to take Midjourney. She loves horror films. And she was like, all right, how can I take my love of horror films and combine it with uh, what we're learning in social studies? I was like, well, you need to explore Midjourney. And so she took um, different characters, different horror film characters. So we've got the Joker. We've got uh, Chucky and Jigsaw. And she was able to put those together. And she was able to rewrite the stories of each of those characters, because we're looking at George Washington, Joseph Martin, Benjamin Franklin, and rewrite a movie that would be about that particular character. So she's able to include content as far as a content description on the back of the movie case. Um, she was able to generate these images, these posters for trailers and all sorts of stuff. And it was absolutely amazing. And it helped her to have deeper buy-in to the project itself. So that's all I got. I, we're almost right on time. Um, if you would like to connect with me, I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to talk to you about uh, flipped learning, project-based learning, AI tools, all of that. Uh, you can scan the different QR codes, connect with me um, on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email and we can connect that way. But hopefully this was helpful. And I'd love to be able to address any questions that you may have at this point. All right. Any, any questions from our viewers? Um, I, I love the fact that you got, or, or that you have students like using AI, they're jumping in, they're creating, um, they're creating content. And the prompt that you gave was fantastic. Like just, it, it it's fun. And the thing is, if students can take that ownership and be like, you know what, I made that. And one of the things that I love telling the students is, you know what, if you do really cool stuff, I'm going to share it with the world and I will post it. And, um, you know, Addison, when I told her, hey, guess what? Your work's going to be in a book. Yeah. Mind blown. I mean, and that just took her buy-in to a whole nother level. Um, and it is. Pride. It's featured I mean, in it, the AI classroom book. So yeah. all of this is in there with the description of how he did it. And then you you got it firsthand from Dan today. And uh, like I, I was glued the whole time. But that the prompting, just the whole time you were presenting on that prompt, I'm like, ooh, what's an acronym for that? <laughs> like, what, how can we, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I, I, L would be list. It was so good. <laughs> I was like, L what? would be list your supplies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, no. Like, right. no, this is this is one that everybody needs to watch. I, I took so many pictures. I was trying, and there were so many comments. I had to keep up with the comments as I'm taking <laughs> pictures of your quotes. Uh, when students have control over how they express their knowledge, they are more willing to seek ways that will allow them to be as successful as possible. You know, it gives them the, you already said that, but it's like wow, dude, you're so great. <laughs> that was so good. That was so, so good. And um, I think it's something that uh, there's so much that was said that will help the fear for so many teachers and all those things we've talked about quite a bit because um, you, yeah, you, you, you nailed it. <laughs> so well, thank you. I'm tired because it was so good. <laughs> just like, 
like all of you guys that are presenting this week, the presenters we have that follow, I wish we could just create a school <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> like uh, just collaborate and work together because uh, like I'm out of the classroom now, but I taught history last year all the way up until um, all the way up until last year. I was teaching eighth and 11th grade history. And uh, if I would have known that we were kind of teaching some of the same things, I would have totally reached out to you and been like, what can we do? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's another huge thing is the ability to collaborate with other teachers. It, it just takes things to a whole different level. And there are some things that I don't know everything about. So if I can find an expert on that particular topic, even better, because when we were studying um, the Declaration of Independence, I was like, all right, who would be the top person to talk to my kids about the Declaration of Independence? So I reached Limited out to the national... Minute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I reached out. I reached out to the National Archives and I was like, hey, would you guys want to Skype with us about, you know, the document? They're like, well, we've never done that before. Um, so sure, let's try it and see if it works. And I mean, my kids were asking questions and I'll never forget this. One student asked, what happens to the Declaration of Independence at night? Oh, and it goes the, to sleep. Well, the presenter was like, if I told you, I'd have to kill you because that is top <laughs> secret. We cannot reveal that information. And of course the kids are like, whoa, that's Didn't awesome. They make a movie about that? They did. They did. But no <laughs> one actually knows. Nobody, it's top secret. Nobody knows what happens to the Declaration of Independence at night, where it goes. Wow. Um, and so, I mean, I started connecting with the U.S. Capitol. Um, I did get a call from the White House. Richie, Never really? forget that. I was in Target and looked down my phone. And it said the White House. And I was like, ooh, I got to take this. So, oh um, but sadly, president wasn't able to meet with my students. Um, but we did get the White House Historical Association. So that was cool. Um, so we've been able to connect with a lot of different people over the years uh, to bring that. And so collaboration is a huge asset to the classroom. And I, I think the message our viewers should take is if you have an idea of someone that you want to connect your kids with, ask oh my goodness just ask, ask. I, mean, I, I did all that through email i just yeah. sent an email yeah let's see what happens the worst thing that can happen is they say no exactly exactly and then you're no worse off exactly. exactly i know yeah but how awesome is it when they say yes i know it's so answer, awesome answer very <laughs> it's a very awesome yeah, yeah. i know i i've always say the same thing to my students i'm like what's the worst that can happen they say right no. <laughs> yes always ask oh that was wonderful um yeah i could i could pick his brain all night the genially <laughs> stuff too i love that people are you know genially uh is is wonderful and i you know i'm a little biased i am a um ambassador but i'm also a huge can i mean can fan can, we're both ambassadors yeah. um but it it has unique things to it and the interactivity uh, is unparalleled yeah, the interactivity just even the, the schedule but even your presentation and if you want to do a game for the classroom i mean the templates oh my goodness yeah, yeah. Right. I, and eily who runs the, the the community she is so great she's she's wonderful so yeah jump on in and play i mean yeah i mean I, I was able to build an actual video game it was yeah. a marvel 8-bit like old school <laughs> nintendo video game all in a Gina Lee template <sighs> and you can put the the music to it. You can find 8-bit characters online, import those images into your um, game, embed questions, all sorts of stuff. And it, I mean, the kids don't even realize that they're studying because they're playing a game. Exactly. And, and then they're like, can I play it again? Yes, you may study again. <laughs> <laughs> you are more than welcome to. Oh my gosh. I know. That's so true. Every time we, I use it, my kids get so excited. Like, oh, this, yeah. is, this is going to be fun. And, and the thing is, the kids, it resonates with them because you made something for them. You right. took their interests their, uh exactly. They were part of the equation when you created that because you're like, my kids will think this is cool. Right. Absolutely. Right. And they do. And they absolutely do. Um, I'm actually making one of my breathing bubbles in there. And it's literally a bubble floating in the sky. And just the, the animation, too. So. But it's yeah. just so great that we have all these tools because, you know, I, I app smash them all. And uh, yeah. like someone said earlier, they design in Canva, they bring it into Genially. It's that was, yep. yeah. <laughs> well, that was you. I should have known. Yeah, I, 
I know I feel bad. You know, I'm a huge fan of, of all of them, you know. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm creating a mid journey, oh. putting it in Canva or putting it in post for my wall uh, and then bringing it into Genially. Right. And so, I mean, there are so many layers that you can put your content into. Yes. And it, it does nothing but support the learner in the classroom. Right. There's no competition. Like this, they're I'm, all incredible tools for different reasons and app smashing them makes it even better. I've yeah. been using Canva. I'll design it in Canva. Like a slide, like let's say I have, you don't want a, a text heavy slide. So I'll have the icons, but when you click on it, it's interactive and it pops up like the, and so I'll, I'll design that and genially, then I'll embed it back in Canva. So when I'm doing a presentation, I can do the Canva live and right. it's interactive genially. So I'm, I'm like clicking around on it in the presentation. So yes. it's, it's just. Yeah, so bring in Doink. I bring in Doink and I put myself in there, you know. So <laughs> bring in your green screen app. So yeah, absolutely. This is why we well, don't sleep, right, Dan? You probably don't sleep either. <laughs> um, it it oh. has a. I have a really hard time shutting my brain off. Yeah. Too, um, many, too many ideas. Too much fun. <laughs> I have way too many tabs open. Yeah, <laughs> that is so. <laughs> oh, Christy, that's funny. Yeah, for UDL, not text heavy. It's funny because the graphic that I made in Canva. And then put in genially for the interactive buttons was on UDL, so um, <laughs> <laughs> that was intentional. <laughs> awesome! Uh, gosh, we could nerd out all day with this, but we have to get get uh, get on with our day. Yeah, uh, on the road, yeah. Oh, my yeah. kids, my kids will be excited that they can be loud again in the house. They've been literally <laughs> that that they must be little mice until um, 9 p.m. But um, one more time, I just want to thank our sponsor for today, CurePod. It's amazing. You saw it in, um, I believe, two of the four presentations tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to share the uh, new po thing I just posted, too. Yes, share. Okay, so I um, just posted this. Hopefully it went through. And let me quickly show you. Okay, so on my page and Amanda's as well, you will see in probably teacher goals soon, uh, this post. Win a chance for a free copy of AI Classroom while attending, watch replays, uh, and, or watching the replays of the week of AI. Please um, take screenshots. Take away screenshots. And I know um, Tanya was doing that earlier. Anything that you have learned, your takeaways, because those takeaways really help people to dive into the ones that that they really want to dive into or um you learn so much just from just from this process of, of people posting so please 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 do that and tag all these people and share the hashtags and all the good stuff so thank you for for doing that and you have a chance to win a copy of this amazing book a copy of the ai classroom and when you're tagging your friends you're tagging them you're giving them an opportunity to join a you know, a free week of PD at their own pace. Um, it doesn't have to be this week. It doesn't have to be next week. Whenever school's out and you've got time to sit back and actually dig into some of these tools, some of the chaos from the day-to-day -day grind has, has stopped. Uh, I have fun playing around with it. Um, it's, it's a fun activity or, or, or project over the summer to, to play and revamp things. So uh, if, if I were going back into the classroom next year, I would definitely be using a lot of stuff from your presentation, Dan. So <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. I am I am my lesson plans are written now for the next few few weeks. <laughs> I love it. I just canceled everything else. This is this is going in. Love it. All right. So um our $25 Canva gift voucher it goes to Tanya. Thank you for posting um uh, the challenge on Heather's session. And again, guys Take pictures, take screenshots, share tidbits of what you've learned, post it on social media, tag teacher goals, tag your friends, tag everybody, tell everybody. And um, we'll, we're looking at that too. We're giving away more copies of the AI Classroom. And don't forget to get your copy or your own very own commemorative week of AI um, forward slash imagine wearing this shirt uh, for $25. <laughs> You're also put into a raffle to win a class set or a school set of books, a free hour of PD. We have more copies of the AI classroom we're giving away. We have more Canva print vouchers. We have licenses to CurePod and more. 
Okay. Right. Now everybody get some rest because we got some more coming. <laughs> yeah. We will see you guys at 530. I want to stay sharp if there's not technical difficulties at 530 <laughs> tomorrow. Um, and tomorrow's sponsor is. Oh, who's tomorrow? Who's it tomorrow? Is. Conquer. I know I just made a poster. Conquer. That's right. Conquer tomorrow. And if you haven't um, checked out Conquer uh, AI, it is a brainchild of Moat and Will Jackson. So we're going to be um, starting with Conquer and uh, going into all of our sessions tomorrow. Our lineup is amazing. We've got another you know, three fantastic presenters tomorrow evening. So come on the channel. I just aged myself. <laughs> grab a coffee, grab a cocktail. We don't care. We can't see it's behind the screen. Just, you know, what well, we have to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye. Take care. <laughs>